The urge to migrate is inherent to human nature. Driven by the search for food or hope for a better future since time immemorial. Throughout history, wars and politically motivated expulsions have also forced people to leave their homes for good. These mass movements have always demanded a great deal from migrants. Their lives and health are threatened. Their right to self-determination is challenged and their individual identities become the objects of other people's prejudices and actions. Here, we're going to look at just seven mass physical movements, seven migration processes which occurred in the 20th century, shaping the identities of millions of people and, by the same token, the European identity. Identity on the Line is a large-scale cooperation project between six cultural history museums and one university, working together to explore the long-term consequences of different migration processes, forced or voluntary, which took place in Europe over the course of the last 100 years. Seven European countries participated in the project – Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Poland, Lithuania, Slovenia and Croatia. And the museum professionals work closely together with professionals from other fields of studies. All countries and institutions have used the same methods and interview guides to talk to three generations of people. The former migrants themselves, their children and grandchildren. Our questions were aiming to understand more about how experiences during or after the migration affected the time witnesses and their families. Were behaviors transferred from one generation to the next or feelings? How important was it for the former migrants to talk about what has happened and how important was it for their children and grandchildren to know? How did the migration affect also their lives and identities? Will you recognize yourself as you discover the stories of some of those former migrants and their descendants? Will you recognize their feelings? In the 20th century alone, most of the peninsula of Istria was governed by four different states. The Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Kingdom of Italy, the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia and, as of 1991, the Republic of Croatia. During World War II, it was part of Italy. 
With the capitulation of Italy and the fall of fascism in 1943, Istria, a borderland and a region of high ethnic diversity, once again became a subject of negotiations. The Paris Peace Treaties of 1947 handed the peninsula to Yugoslavia. For a short period, though, it was also divided into Zone A, which was controlled by the Allies, and Zone B, which was part of the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. That came to an end when Italy, the United Kingdom, the United States of America and Yugoslavia signed a Memorandum of Understanding in London in 1954. The attitude of the newly established political authorities towards the indigenous Italians in Istria was one of strong suspicion. This hostility was driven by ideology and nationalism. Treated as foreigners in their own country, itself now Slavic, they were often seen as leftovers of the previous brief Italian rule in Istria, which had lasted from 1920 to 1943 and had become the fascist regime in its later phase. Indeed, many of the Italian Istrians were considered to be fascists. Unlike the extensive Slavic population, they were often members of the upper class and as such, they were dismissed, considered to be part of the bourgeoisie, the class that the new communist-oriented authorities were trying to disempower. The threats, humiliations, and even assassinations occasionally inflicted on the Italians in the immediate post-war period frightened their community. Their social, religious, and cultural life was changing immensely, just as it was for everyone in Istria. As a result, many of the inhabitants, not only those who identified as Italian, but also numerous Istrians of Slavic origin, were forced to leave in search of a better life. Their destinations were mainly Italy, the USA and Australia. Many of the people who opted to emigrate to Italy spent years in refugee camps throughout that country, waiting for job opportunities. Adapting to their new social and cultural realities was difficult because they were often regarded as second-class Italians or even fascists thanks to their decision to leave communist Yugoslavia. The exodus of over 200,000 people left Istria partly depopulated and bereft of the cultural traditions of the semi-urban and urban populations. A percentage of Italian Istrians did remain, though, their life wasn't easy either, since they were objects of suspicion not only to the new authorities, but also to the Italian Istrians who'd left. Sapmi is the land of the Sami. It extends without boundaries across the territory of four nations, encompassing a vast area of mountainous and forested country, tundra and wetlands. This is where the Sami people have hunted and fished for thousands of years, roaming the endless trails and naming the mountaintops and streams. It's where they've raised their children, sung the praises of the land, and appeased the gods for good hunting. It's where they've followed the reindeer, driven their herds to better grazing, and watched over the newborn calves. The history of Sapmi is full of forced relocations. Time and again, kings and holders of power moved to the Sami people, allowing others to use their land. Those who disobeyed were punished. The hearts of indigenous peoples are tightly intertwined with their land. In fact, 
The word Sapmi means both the land and the people. In the olden days, numerous families of reindeer herders moved from coast to coast, regardless of national borders. All this changed with a shift in border politics around a century ago. In the north, the number of farmers began to increase, and the reindeer herds arriving in their traditional grazing areas now became competitors for the land. Norway saw the nomadic life as a burden on the country and the settled population, and came to an agreement with Sweden to limit reindeer husbandry in certain areas. As a result of the new law, a great many Sami herders lost their traditional summer grazing sites. Thousands of reindeer suddenly needed new grazing lands, and a vast number of families were forced to move to new areas. Thanking the land for the life it had given them, they headed south, leaving their relatives, and sometimes their children. Few of them would ever return. They took their stories with them, though. The elderly reminisced about their former home, the land they had loved and left. They called their new home in the south the land of the wolverines and bears. The Sami, who already lived there, wanted to keep their land, of course. But those who'd had no choice but to migrate also needed homes. The subsequent conflicts over the southern territories made life no easier. This part of Identity on the Line focuses on the consequences of those forced relocations and how they affected the families involved for generations to come. The conflicts that arose then are still having an impact today, a century later. The United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples states that people cannot be forced to move against their will. Their land rights are regulated by international law. Despite this, the forcible displacement of indigenous peoples continues to this day. The Holocaust in Lithuania resulted in the almost total extermination of the Lithuanian and Polish Jews, who often represented more than half the population of the country's small towns and villages before World War II. Around 80% of them were killed during the first six months of the war. After Nazi Germany invaded Poland on the 1st of September 1939, Vilnius became an Eastern European place of refuge. By mid-1940, the Soviet Union had occupied Lithuania. On the 22nd of June 1941, Germany attacked the Soviet Union. Within a week, Lithuania lay under Nazi occupation. A series of pogroms against the Jews was launched by the Nazis and carried out by their local helpers, the toll of victims reached several thousand. Mass killings of Jews were organized by the Nazis' SD security service and security police, and they were conducted by special extermination squads, local police, and local collaborators. They began in late June 1941, straight after the German occupation, and continued until July 1944. In 1942, the Jews who had survived in Vilnius, Kaunas, Shiolei, and a handful of small towns were herded into ghettos, where they were confined under terrible conditions. They strove not to give up. 
In the ghettos, the youth, in particular, joined underground anti-Nazi organizations that sought to use armed force to resist their oppressors. In January 1942, a proclamation rang out in the Vilnius ghetto. We will not be led like lambs to the slaughter. Around 2,000 members of the underground resistance in the ghettos managed to make their break for freedom and join the Soviet partisans in the woods. They fought the Nazis side by side, but had to endure the constant anti-Semitic attitude of their non-Jewish fellow combatants. In 1944, during the German withdrawal from Lithuania, a number of the Jews, who were still confined to the Kaunas and Shiolei ghettos, were massacred. Those who weren't slaughtered were deported to the Nazis' Stutthof, Dachau and Auschwitz concentration camps. By the beginning of July 1944, a total of 196,000 Jews had been killed in Lithuania. No more than 9,000 came out of the Holocaust alive. For many of those who survived the Holocaust, it was very hard indeed to try and start a new life in a country that had become a collection of mass graves where their loved ones lay. At the same time, the communist authorities were persecuting Jewish communities with increasingly anti-Semitic policies, imposing restrictions on their religious and cultural life and working to destroy their heritage. Once the State of Israel was established, the USSR promised that all Jews who wanted to leave would be allowed to do so. After Israel began to turn to the West, though, the Iron Curtain made it more or less impossible for the Jews still living in Lithuania to emigrate to Israel, a journey which is known as making Aliyah. Those who succeeded enjoyed the benefits of the excellent support system developed for them by the Israeli authorities. In the aftermath of World War II, what's often referred to as the Second Yugoslavia came into being in Southeast Europe. It was made up of six socialist republics, Slovenia, Croatia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Macedonia, Montenegro and Serbia, along with two autonomous provinces within Serbia, Vojvodina and Kosmet. The new federal state was home to 22.4 million inhabitants. Migration within its borders soon became very common. Sometimes it was incentivized by the central government. At other times, it was driven by the emerging processes of industrialization, urbanization, and post-war rebuilding. People's motives for moving were varied. Some were looking for employment. Others were pursuing specialized education or independence or were fulfilling professional requirements. Many were following their hearts. Some moved to join their spouses or family members. Others were in search of a change of scenery or new opportunities. Slovenia, the northernmost of the six federal republics, became a major immigration destination, especially in the 1970s. The years leading up to the dissolution of Yugoslavia 
brought Slovenian independence in 1991, followed by the Yugoslav Wars. During this period, the attitude towards the 200,000 people from the other Yugoslav republics who were living in the Slovenia region grew increasingly hostile. There was a growing perception of them as unwanted foreigners or even as enemies of the state. In the 1980s and 1990s, expressions of intolerance and exclusion started bubbling to the surface. Immigrants from the south of the country were mostly characterized as lower working class, and they were pejoratively labeled Chefuri and them from the bottom, for instance. They were also stigmatized because of the last letters of their surnames, and in general, they were treated as second-class citizens. The citizenship laws, which were either changed or passed in the 1990s in all of the former Yugoslav republics, were among the primary legal mechanisms behind the disintegration of Yugoslavia. At the same time, they deprived or excluded groups of citizens who lived in republics that weren't their country of origin. On the 26th of February 1992, 25,671 people of non-Slovenian origin were erased from the permanent residence records, losing all the rights they'd enjoyed up to that point. Frictions also arose within individual communities affected by the ideological conflicts and divisions of the Yugoslav Wars, which were fought on and off for almost a decade. Homes that had been in families for generations were destroyed, and once familiar places became theatres of war and the sites of appalling war crimes. Personal and collective identities were weaponized by the warring sides, and the processes of belonging and exclusion became fraught with existential danger and entangled in what were often highly conflicting emotions. With a family history of migration as a background, the process of forging a personal identity within the newly formed Republic of Slovenia thus became fragmented, pressurized, and finally, fluid. Here, Identity on the Line focuses on the German occupation of Norway during World War II and the long-term effects triggered by the troops' influx, presence and withdrawal. So the focus here is slightly different. Between 1940 and 1945, some 500,000 German soldiers were posted to Norway occupying a country with a total population of barely three million. This meant that one person in every six was German. In some parts of the country, the ratio was even higher. During the five years of the occupation, the soldiers interacted with the local communities in various ways. They employed Norwegians, fell in love with Norwegian girls and women, married them and got many of them pregnant. They also recruited political sympathizers and brutally punished and tortured those who opposed them. When the occupation ended in 1945, the Germans left a Norwegian population which is still struggling with the long-term consequences of their interactions more than 75 years later. The local communities and the Norwegian government usually meted out harsh punishment to anyone who had supported the Germans. This included the women. If they'd been involved with a German soldier, their heads were often forcibly shaved and they were excluded from their families 
and communities. A great many of the German soldiers' children were placed in special childcare institutions. They were seen as illegitimate offspring that no one wanted any contact with. Other matters were avoided in the public discourse, though, including the high number of companies and individuals who had worked for the Germans or supplied them with materials they needed. What happened during World War II still plays a part in shaping how people see themselves and their family's history and identity. Two or three generations on, some families still find it challenging to talk about that part of their past. Local communities played a crucial role in dispensing punishment and exclusion, or acceptance and support. The questions asked by the children and grandchildren of those who were punished by the Germans during the war, or by their local community afterwards, were often met with silence. The Norwegians telling their stories here talked about how those secrets, rooted in traumatic experiences, frequently led to behaviour patterns such as violence and poor anger management, which often passed from generation to generation, as did unspoken feelings of shame, guilt, fear and loneliness. These negative spirals were only broken when those who had been eyewitnesses started to talk about what had happened. An understanding of what had been lying beneath the surface was then possible. Where that occurred, there was a clear improvement in relations between the generations. From 1721 to 1953, Greenland was a Danish colony. Because Denmark kept it closed to the outside world and controlled all travel onto and off the island, very few Danes or Greenlanders made journeys in either direction. Between 1900 and 1939, Greenland was gradually opened up and more Greenlanders and Danes were able to travel to and fro. The majority of journeys from Greenland to Denmark were made for reasons of education. The main fields of interest were theology, health and social studies, translation and education itself. Orphaned and disabled Greenlandic children were also sent for stays in Denmark. During World War II, contact was disrupted by the German occupation of Denmark. Greenland was secured by American forces, but German troops tried to establish weather station on the island's east coast. In 1953, at the request of the United Nations and following a Danish referendum, Greenland's status as a colony changed and it became a Danish administrative unit known as an Amt. This meant that for the next 26 years, it was governed as an integral part of Denmark. Then, in 1979, the Home Rule Act granted Greenland limited autonomy and gave it control of several government functions. Greenland gained self-rule in 2009. Most areas of government are controlled in Nuuk by the National Parliament. The Self-Government Act 
also means that the rights to the island's underground resources and its raw materials are the preserve of the Greenland government. However, the Danish parliament still has jurisdiction over areas like defence and foreign affairs. So, the two countries have a long shared history with an uneven balance of power between them. Together, Greenland, the Faroe Islands and Denmark constitute the Kingdom of Denmark. The Danes and the Greenlanders are two nations that are very unlike. They look different. They have different languages and cultures. They differ in their values, humour, cuisine and much more. Even so, their shared history means that many Greenlanders live or settle in Denmark often because of educational opportunities, or for reasons of family or work, or as a result of health issues. Denmark currently has around 5,800,000 inhabitants, and 17,000 of them are Greenlanders. On the other hand, there are some 57,000 people in Greenland today. Inuits make up 85% of the population, and the remaining 15% are Danes. Preconceived notions of what and who the people of Greenland and their descendants are go back a long way in Denmark. This often results in prejudices, misunderstandings and an underlying racism at both the individual and the societal level. The present-day Polish borders are the result of World War II and the decisions made at the Yalta and Potsdam conferences in 1945 by the USA, the Soviet Union and the United Kingdom, also known as the Big Three. The Red Army had annexed Poland's eastern territories in 1939 and Stalin was adamant that they would not be returned. Poland would be compensated for this by the expansion of its western borders to Germany's loss. Thousands of people in the east were forced to choose between leaving the place they called home or renouncing their nationality and becoming citizens of the Soviet Union. Abandoning their homes and most of their belongings, they made their journeys on military transports, travelling in cattle wagons for what was often several weeks in many cases, they were heading to the northwest, where their destination was the Pomeranian region. They were told that they would be playing a part in resettling territory that had been restored to Poland. Some of the Polish settlers came from deep within the Soviet Union, where they'd been exiled after the Red Army's annexation of Poland's eastern territories. Others came from regions of Poland that were Polish before the war, and remained Polish after it, but had been laid to waste by the Nazi occupation. Even during the war, the present-day Swarovsk, known at the time as Stolp in Pommern, was a small, quiet, picturesque Pomeranian city close to the Baltic Sea. The residents were mainly German, with some Germans of Polish origin and some members of an ethnic Slavic group from East Pomerania, the Kashubians. On the 8th of March, 1945, the Red Army took over the city. The first Poles arrived in Swarovski in April. After the brutal war years, it was impossible for the three nationalities to coexist peacefully. This resulted in numerous personal tragedies. At the same time, the future affiliation of the land was uncertain. It was in July, at the Potsdam Conference, that the Big Three finally decided where Poland's western border would be. The line they drew on the map followed the Oder and Lusatian Nysa rivers. The Oder-Nysa line meant that Swarovsk 
together with a vast swathe of Pomerania, would be part of Poland. Most of the German inhabitants were compelled to leave the city and their homes and head for Germany, which had now been divided into West Germany and East Germany. There, they would face the search for a new place to call their own. A handful of them decided to stay in Swupsk and start this new chapter of their lives there. They remained exactly where they were, and yet they moved from Germany to Poland. By 1950, only 1,089 of the town's inhabitants were people who had lived there before the war. At the same time, a new population, devastated by the war and swept aside by history, had arrived in search of a brighter future. It was a unique migration process, where almost the entire population of a territory was replaced. The price of political decisions was paid by thousands of people from both sides. After the long years of war, they wanted to believe that better times were coming and to start their lives anew. Under the surface of our societies, there are thousands and thousands of stories which could add shades and details to a black and white picture of historical events. But many of these stories are too private, too personal or too difficult to share. One might only want to forget or has the feeling that no one wants to listen. But experiences not properly addressed can become secrets which have long-term consequences not only for the time witnesses themselves but also for the generations to come. The children and grandchildren of the time witnesses can often sense that something has happened and that this something also affects their own lives. For the generations to come, the not knowing what has happened often has severe effects on one's personal life and well-being. To develop a safe understanding of one's own identity, there is a need to know where one comes from and what has shaped the parents and grandparents, as they often had major effects on one's life. If the information is held back, for whatever reason, one is not able to settle and come to peace with whom one is or wants to be.
Here, museum institutions and museum professionals might function as mediators and connecting links between those who want to share, but do not know how, and those who need to know. Museums have a responsibility to contribute to filling blanks in our joint history and to be a safe place to show all aspects of this joint history. Many ethical considerations are required and trust has to be earned. Europe is continuously transforming. All migration processes, even the painful ones, lead to new cultural diversity, which in itself is a positive force in today's societies. Shared experiences empower the citizens of Europe and help create our joint European identity. A European identity based on the values of all of its people, respect for human dignity and human rights, freedom, equality and democracy. Identity on the Line had several goals and the major ones were related to our informants and to our visitors. We wanted to make unheard voices heard and thereby to fill some blanks in the perception of our joint history. We wanted you to understand that experiences related to migration are diverse within a large scope from being traumatic to empowering and that they are generally valid. We are all constantly moving, forced or voluntarily, physically and emotionally. We move between home and away, belonging and alienation, silence and openness, resilience and vulnerability, injustice and reconciliation. Who are you and what makes you, you? Who has the power to define your identity? and which feelings do you choose to focus on? We are all constantly moving, either forced to or voluntarily, physically and emotionally. We move between home and away, belonging and alienation, silence and openness, resilience and vulnerability, injustice and reconciliation. <laughs> 